Welcome to the next event of the World Discussion Series Schulz under the theme of Opportunities to Improve the Post-COVID-19 World. Today, Julia Bader from the University of Amsterdam has kindly accepted to join us for an interview on the future of Europe-China relations. She is an associate professor at the Department of Political Science and her research focuses on authoritarianism, on China's foreign relations and on the external dimensions of China's authoritarianism. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my first question is regarding Europe's and China's economic ties. Because in large parts of Africa, we can already witness how China's economic investment leads to increasing political influence, which is sometimes even referred to as neo-colonialism. And as China's investment, especially in Eastern Europe, is expanding as well. And for example, the Chinese company Huawei is being considered for building the 5G network in Europe. Do you think the close economic ties will have an impact on Europe's political sphere? Uh, uh, I think many observers would actually argue that this political impact is already there. And one recent example is the, uh, the prevention of a, of a common united position of the EU in the in United Nations Human Rights Council uh, on uh, human rights violations um, of China, which was prevented by the, the Greek uh, government. And so we already can see that sometimes in uh, individual governments tend to have different positions um, and make it very hard for the uh, EU to come up with a united um, position on matters that concern China. Um, but in the past, I think the fault lines within the EU were more between uh, those countries that traded a lot with China and had a lot of exports to China, while now these investments that you mentioned play a bigger role. Um, what, you know, Huawei will change to that debate, I'm not so sure, but my, I, my hunch is that the investments Huawei makes to Europe are different in kind from other investments because our industries and our um, societies, uh, critical infrastructure in our societies increasingly rely on uh, digitalization and on uh, digital networks. And if you have a leverage over that, you may even have more influence and more leverage to pressure someone to do something that they would otherwise not have done. And so that specifically the introduction or the, the inclusion of Huawei into these networks may be a problem. Um, I'm not an expert to judge to what extent, uh, um, because the EU has now decided to exclude Huawei from crucial uh, parts of that network and to what extent that is technically possible is something that I personally cannot uh, judge. But I uh, definitely think that um, the more that the more Huawei will be included in these critical technologies and in, in, in networks, and it already is there, that will increase Chinese influence in Europe. Okay, thank you. Now moving on a bit to the question sort of of authoritarianism and democracy. We often read in the news about China's influence in the world, but as the economic relations between the EU and China are being drawn closer together from both sides. Can we also witness influence from Europe on China? And additionally uh, to that, from a Western perspective, the Chinese regime is often regarded as quite stable. But you mentioned in a podcast that from a Chinese view, that is not necessarily the case. So could Europe possibly also promote democracy in China? Yes, I think that was the hope for much of the 2000s. But I think we have passed that stage where West, the West could have had an influence on the domestic politics in China. And I also think we have passed the stage where that, where that was the dominant thinking in Western capitals that by uh, integrating China and by engaging China, we will have that influence. So yeah, throughout most of the 2000s, the idea was that by um, socializing China into, you know, the international, uh, already existing liberal international uh, order, by engaging China, by creating mutually in, uh, interdependent trade relations, we would have leverage to also 
change China and to support democratization and maybe even trigger democratization in China and at least to socialize it into liberal democratic values. But I think this perspective has changed a lot. So it was not it, it was only partly successful. Um, and Chinese leaders have made crystal clear that political reforms are not on the agenda, but certainly under President Xi Jinping, the domestic situation in China has become increasingly repressive and with even less space for political opposition or dissenting voices. So I think in many Western think tanks and Western capitals now, we acknowledge that changing China, socializing China is a wishful thinking. But I would also like to say that I think the, the initial assumption, starting assumption that um, we have, you know, a symmetric relationship is maybe mm -hmm. Erroneous or faulty to some degree, and we increasingly realize that this uh, relationship is not so symmetric than we, we initially thought, as we initially thought, and and maybe um, uh, not so balanced as we thought, and that we quite uh, overestimated our own weight. And so, from the Western perspective, if you want to. Um, if you want to pressure someone, for example, on domestic human rights uh, violations, uh, you need to also to sacri sacrifice something. But Western companies are usually keen to invest in China and to extend to the Chinese market. Or Western countries um, nowadays want to um, attract Chinese investment. So um, it can be politically really difficult for, polit uh, for politicians or, or governments to decide to sanction China for domestic human rights violations with economic tools, with economic means. Mm -hmm. It is basically also punishing your own economy and your own enterprises. But it's not only that, it's even worse, because for the Chinese side, it looks much different. The Chinese side has very different leverage over their economy. So the Chinese government can incentivize and direct much better um, the economy, but also uh, individual enterprises. And so for them, it's much easier uh, to, to use economic tools in their diplomacy. And actually, that's also what we see. So we see, uh, um, we call it economic stagecraft in China's diplomacy all over the place. And economic statecraft simply means to use economic means to achieve diplomatic goals. So examples would be when um, the Norwegian um, uh, Nobel Peace Prize was given to Liu Xiaobao, then Norway was punished by a freeze of political relations and of economic relations. Another more recent example even is when uh, Australia uh, asked for an investigation into the origins of the SARS-2 virus. It was threatened by economic uh, sanctions immediately from China. And uh, there's even statistical um, evidence. You can even, even statistically show that trade goes down for a couple of years when a statement in the capacity of its state function meets up with the Dalai Lama. So China is using that tool and that makes it very difficult for Western countries, particularly when they compete about or uh, compete over these uh, um, economic relations and market access to China to at the same time use economic tools <laughs> to sanction China, right? And so I would not only say it's hard to use or to, to anticipate this economic interdependence and economic relations to have an influence on China, it's even could be even the case that the more you trade with China, the, the, the more you are silenced on issues that are of importance to Chinese leadership, such as human rights violations. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, now you've already sort of yeah, refer to the symmetric or rather asymmetric uh, relationship between China and the EU. And um, in a report, the EU Commission called China last year a systemic rival, which has quite a negative connotation to it. So do you think this sort of negative view changed with the COVID-19 crisis, where, for example, uh, the US under the Trump administration appears to be an increasingly less stable ally? <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, uh, I have no special relationship with the uh, EU Commission, so I don't know how the COVID has changed the thinking about China, but I personally, I don't think that um, the COVID uh, pandemic will change the European per, uh, perspective on, on China. And um, no matter what the US does. <laughs> so it's, it's crystal clear that, that, that the US is, is really uh, painfully failing in, 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 in leadership here. So, um, in the last edition of The Economist, the, um, the Economist wrote this COVID pandemic is a telling case study um, to, to investigate the relationship or the rivalry between the US and China in terms of world leadership. And I think that is a fitting description, except for, I would add, I don't think it's a particularly successful case for China. And so this, this uh, unwillingness or an, an inability of the US to take on leadership, it's, it's a problem for Europe, <laughs> and, but it's something that precedes the, the pandemic. And so in the past, we uh, had several um, cases where the Chinese position and the Chinese um, ambition to, to, you know, actually do something constructive in world leadership was much more sensi sensible for European, uh, for the Europeans and where they would actually um, ally with China. So think of um, the uh, Paris climate agreement where Xi Jinping decided to stick to the agreement even when President Trump decided to, to withdraw. Then another example would be the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. That was an initiative by China, partly driven by the inability of the US to reform the existing Bretton Woods system, so the uh, World Bank and the IMF. And in the end, whole, almost the whole of Europe joined in this initiative against the will of the US. And I think in these cases, uh, for European leaders, they would take sides with China because it makes sense and because they considered that uh, um, yeah, th these initiatives as, as, as constructive. And so China has profited in terms of international reputation from the withdrawing of or backtracking of US leadership. But in the specific case of the pandemic, I think I, it's hard for me to believe that the, U, the Europeans will eventually side with China, even if the US is failing to do anything, and even if China is now pledging more money to the WTO. And simply the re reason why I think that is because A, the Chinese leadership is part of the problem in this specific case, and B, um, in a couple of, so you mentioned already this report with a, with a strategic rivalry, but uh, across the board, I think Europe has become much more critical about the role of China during the last couple of years. And so it's hard for me to believe that anyone at the EU level will buy in a Chinese narrative in this case. And so what China is now trying to do is um, using the pandemic to promote a positive image about China, uh, by, you know, sending medical uh, equipment and using that as a propaganda tool to show their willingness and their gen generosity. Um, and by the, along the way, that creates nice headlines for domestic audience. If you can write, look, the world is smacking for our help and they admire our management of this crisis and they're failing badly in the US. But at the same time, when uh, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, EU agency wanted to publish a report on disinformation about the pandemic, and they had to rewrite the report because of pressure of China. Um, then there was the case about Australia. They want to investigate the, the origin of the virus and they get pressured from China. So I don't think, given this background, that anyone at the at the EU level will buy into this narrative of China. And uh, yeah, we will see what happens, but I don't think it's a good case study to say this is now Chinese leadership against uh, American failure. Okay.
And also in terms of the yeah COVID-19 uh, pandemic, in many European countries, the Chinese way of handling the pandemic with the use of a Corona app has recently been applied. And as a lot of this technology is imported from China, what effect will this have on sort of surveillance? Um, so what effect will this have on surveillance in Europe? Uh, if you want to use that tool for control and surveillance, you can do that. You can see that in other Asian countries as well, Singapore, South Korea, where it's also used to enforce quarantine rules. So it's quite intrusive. It can be quite intrusive. Uh, but it, I think um, it, the answer to your question is hard because there are different versions of the app. And personally, I was quite surprised to see when last week in Germany this another version of this app was introduced that even uh, very consumer oriented, privacy oriented NGOs and agencies would be very positive about the app because there was such a big discussion about it before it was even launched that um, it was tried to engineer the app in a way to prevent misuse and intrusion by the way it is set up. So I'm again not a, the expert to judge whether it's possible to make such an app, you know, leakage proof or hacking proof. I think there's always some kind of a risk, but apparently you can design it in a way that is much less intrusive and can cannot so easily be misused um, as as the version that is used in in China or in other Asian countries. Um, but the other part of the story, story, of course, is always the context. So who is using it, the agents, and what is the, the legal context in which that is used? What are the, the, the control mechanisms that, that ensure that this app is not misused? And so um, I would, if, if you ask me about the surveillance or the potentials for surveillance in Europe, I would say it might lead to more surveillance and uh, control. But I would expect that to happen in places where there are already anti-democratic players around, where there is maybe already a weakened rule of law or weakened control mechanisms, weakened uh, uh, independent courts that can rein in the agents who have access to data and who can use it, the app. Mm -hmm. um, so since you're already talking about sort of uh, weakened democracies within Europe, um, I was wondering what can Europe do to protect its democracy from these authoritarian influences from China? A lot. <laughs> so I think the first thing is to understand that we all profit from a united position as Europeans. And so I think that EU needs to do everything they can to make the EU speak with one voice when it comes to issues that concern China. And so rather than um, allowing China to divide Europe by using short-term economic incentives, the EU needs to make sure that this long-term interest in keeping up liberal democratic values is really in our own interest. And so that may imply that we need to continue to redistribute at the EU level to disincentivize uh, weaker EU members to play the China card. And then, of course, in addition, we need to strengthen our democratic institutions, the, the institutions at the core, like the parliaments, parties, uh, independent courts. And um, how can we strengthen them? I think transparency is, is, is a key word here. We need to make sure that it's very transparent how decisions are taken and why they are taken and make sure that it's also uh, transparent who gives money for what. So um, I'm now talking about lobbyism, but it turns out that China is also great in lobbying. <laughs> and so we can, for example, take a very concrete example how uh, other countries that are even more in the influence sphere of China than we are, how they try to tackle this uh, this challenge. And for example, again, in Australia, if you look at Australia, they have in recently introduced a law that obliges um, uh, uh, political figures to be transparent on where they receive money from, for which agents they speak, and particularly if these are uh, uh, external foreign 
um, agents and not only governments, but also government related individuals or government related companies. And I think that extends to, you know, how parties of finance, we want to know from whom parties receive money. And there's, I think, a lot of thing, uh, uh, things you could still improve uh, at the EU level, but also in individual countries. Another thing that I think is very important is when I speak about strengthening uh, democratic institutions is the more peripheral institutions that are still necessary and crucial for a functioning democracy, such as um, an independent uh, news, uh, independent research to ensure, you know, an, an open but well-informed debate. Um, and we, we all need, you know, uh, quality newspapers, uh, quali qualitatively, um, a high qualitative investigative journalism, independent knowledge creation, independent research to, under to understand what, is, what China wants, what China is doing and to understand China itself. So we also need to make sure that these institutions actually are independent and to, to safeguard these institutions from money that comes, for example, from China. And that can also, you know, that can mean you need to fund these institutions better. And we tend to think of a newspaper that has a sound business model as being an independent newspaper. But I think economic influence can also quickly translate into political influence. Um, and so, or give incentives to say certain things and don't say other things. So I, I think we need to reconsider that. But the same holds also for universities, for example. I, I see that from my own, you know, profession. Um, there needs to be rules how we deal with grant, uh, grants from China. And that's not shouldn't be the individual researchers task to figure it out. It should be uh, transparent. Um, so that's another area where we need to, or we can reinforce um, our our uh, democratic values. And then there's also another uh, interesting um, example to look at uh, Taiwan, um, where they have found quite some creative solutions to tackle uh, disinformation in social media because they are also in the front line of uh, disinformation coming from China and where they have also stepped up, you know, uh, how they communicate with their citizens and how they treat fake news on social media in a very humorous way. And so all these things, I think, are very, very important to uh, safeguard our de uh, democracies. OK, great. So then um, this probably already you mentioned probably already a few aspects for my final question, which is if you had the power to change something in Europe after COVID-19, what would that be? So I think it this pandemic really um, uncovers or unravels all, you know, the uh, conditions that, that are inhumane in our societies. And that that's um, the, the social inequality and in, in where we can see how people who have less access or less paid job, maybe uh, not so well educated people, but that immediately translates into not so good uh, health care and high you know, um, um, death tolls among these people often. Um, yes, same time, we can see how, whether it's in Singapore or in, in, in this slaughterhouse in Germany or elsewhere in, in Europe, how um, weak labor is, are still in, exploited. So I think if there's a lot of things to do when it comes to social inequality, social justice that we should, you know, improve on. And again, I think communication and how we the way we engage in debates and the way we engage in information and information, um, yeah, discussion about information needs to be uh, something that we we need to really take to the heart because it's something that that is very crucial for our societies. But it it can see time and again that it's polarizing um and, and and very you know poisoning for our uh, societies so i think we need to think about clever ways to deal with um, yeah polarization that is based on also fake news and misinformation
Okay, so thank you very much on the behalf of Walt for joining us today and for elaborating on this complex issue. And you're also warmly invited to watch our upcoming event on tax evasions in the Netherlands. Oh, interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay.